all together now, welcoming families, children, and youth. I am Melinda Wenner Bradley. I serve Philadelphia Yearly Meeting as the Director of Programs. This is a presentation that is based on research from ecumenical sources, looking back into our past as friends, looking ahead to where we might go. And it is grounded in many conversations with friends in my travel and work among them, both in PYM and beyond. The phrase all together now for me is shorthand for creating all ages community is vital to the future of our religious society of friends. The artwork you see here was done by a young friend at annual sessions in 2019. This is the body gathered in the big plenary room. You can see the clerk's table um, in the front and the rows of friends in chairs. And then there are some quilts on the floor. The youth program staff brought the quilts to annual sessions for um, places that um, people with small, shorter legs could sit on comfortably, um, places to gather together. And we put the quilts on the side of the plenary room next to the clerk's table. And then the quilts started to move. First, they were moved by somebody to the front of the room in between the clerk's table and the first rows of chairs. And then later, the young friends, our high school youth, moved the quilts again by pushing the chairs, very carefully rearranging the chairs um, around them and pulling the quilts back into really the body of um, our seating so that um, the children and young people and the adults who came to sat on the quilts on the floor were really in the middle of the whole group. We were being all together. So how do we invite more people into a space where we are all together? When a family crosses the threshold um, into our meeting as visitors, as seekers, they really bring with them three sets of needs. We need to welcome the adults on their spiritual journey, whether they are parents or grandparents, caretakers, foster parents, people who come with children by the hand, but themselves are seeking nurture and support on their own individual adult spiritual journey. They are bringing children with them for whom they are seeking some kind of spiritual nurture or religious education, um, maybe like what they had as their, a child themselves, or maybe something very different that they hope for. Parents often don't feel equipped to offer this kind of spiritual education to their children, and yet parents are their children's first and most important teachers. But they come to us, these adults, with these young people seeking something for them. And finally, they're seeking some kind of spiritual home for their family, a community to belong to, possibly a place where they can um, serve and give witness to their values and beliefs with others. So the needs of those adults, the needs of those children, the needs of the family. How can we speak to that? The questions on the right side of the slide are alternatives to asking things like, where are you in school or what is your job? Things that get past some of the possible assumption we might make about people and help them to maybe feel more welcomed um, as they are. Elise Bolding was a friend who was at the forefront of the peace studies um, uh, movement. And she also wrote a lot about families and families in Quaker meetings. She wrote about the importance of generational sharing and, again, belonging. Um, her image in this quote of overlapping life cycles feels important. When we think about intergenerational community, um, it's a little bit, taking a little bit further the idea of multi-generational. Multi-generational simply means there's more than one generation present. That can be true with a group of adults in a room. Um, intergenerational means that whatever the ages are, that all the generations present are being welcomed and that their needs are being met, that their gifts are being equally seen and valued. And so we're called to try to be an intergenerational community in our Quaker meetings. The question is how we do that. 
And Boulding's image also really um, highlights that this is not about putting one age or generation above another. Um, by centering the needs of families and children, we're not asking to trade the comfort of adults for the needs of younger people. We're asking that everyone's needs be equally seen and met because we are all connected. The writer Diana Butler Bass, um, in her work, Christianity After Religion, talks about a great reversal that we are called to. Um, we're living in a time with um, the great resignation, but she writes about a great reversal. Um, that in spiritual communities, we have in the last few generations seen belonging as something that begins with belief and then we learn the practices of our beliefs, our, our particular faith community. We learn how to behave. And then, therefore, we belong. And Diana Butler Bass writes that this is a reversal of the way it was um, in the time of early Christianity. When it was about belonging first, about gathering with a community. She writes, long ago, faith was a matter of community first, practices second, and belief as a result of the first two. So we might think about ourselves and even go back to um, early friends who in some ways were trying to get back to a place that more like what primitive Christianity had looked like in community, with an emphasis on community, um, and then learning our practices as friends, and those of course are being grounded in faith. Early friends used what were called inquiries, um, inquiries were what became our queries, but those first inquiries were about care for community. They were questions like, who is in prison? Whose family needs help in this time? How can we take care of one another in our young Quaker communities? And so um, I wonder what it would look like if we really began by thinking about being a community, a community of inclusion and belonging, where people can learn our practices and come to belong to our faith. The Vital Meetings Project was a joint project of New England and New York Yearly Meeting um, that I participated in when I served New York Yearly Meeting as the Children and Youth Field Secretary. It was funded by the Shoemaker Fund and it sought to really um, work very directly in service to local meetings to explore questions about belonging and inclusion. In New York Yearly Meeting, we were looking at families with children and how they could better become parts of um, meeting communities. And we talked about all the things listed here. We learned a lot about experimenting with time and schedules, being open and flexible, how important it is to play and share meals together, um, thinking about someone something like friendly eights. Um, you know, families with kids uh, may need a bigger group than an eight, which I think probably goes back to four couples getting together. Um, so friendly gatherings or friendly twelves, something that helps people to really gather as um, multi-generational groups for this kind of fellowship. Thinking about all ages worship became something that was important in the project. How do we teach about um, our unprogrammed worship across generations? Developing opportunities to talk about spiritual gifts was something that was revealed as being deeply important to belonging in a meeting, including inviting relative newcomers, who are often younger people, into participation and leadership positions in the meeting and finding ways to talk with each other about how we put our Quaker faith into action in the world. All of these became really clearly important ways that we were building relationship and community in meetings. Signs, spaces, and schedules, very mundane things, but they are simple things that often have very strongly spoken and unspoken messages for people. You walk into a meeting house, you begin to um, make dis um, observations and then decisions about your own sense of belonging there based on what you see and experience. And this is a picture, if you aren't familiar with it, of Swarthmore Hall in England, Margaret Fell's home. 
um, where she first met George Fox um, in this area and invited him here and he came back to this house. Um, it is um, a historic site now in England and I could not help but take this picture when I was there of a children's table and chairs. Um, they look like they're from Ikea and um, the image of a place for children at Margaret Fell's house. So this slide has on it um, two images that are both taken from websites and the toolbars on um, the menu on websites. The one across the top was from another denomination's website. It's not from a Quaker meeting. The one on the left um, column is. And just take a minute to look at them and think about what are the unspoken messages of those words, of the order that they are in, of what they tell you about what is important to these congregations, what it is they want you to see and know about them first. Spaces give unspoken immediate clues to families about how prepared the meeting is to welcome them. Um, so things like um, looking at um, spaces for children and youth programs. Um, are they welcoming? Are they accessible? Um, what's on the walls and the bookshelves in a um, children's space or in the meeting library? What images and illustrations are there on the walls? Um, these are things that um, are an opportunity for wider inclusion, and they're an opportunity for us to pay attention um, to bring a really anti-racist, anti-racism lens to um, what's in our meeting houses and the unspoken messages of who um, is there and belongs there and is welcome there. Is there a booster seat or a high chair um, in your fellowship space? Whether you have children currently um, using them or not, um, being ready. Is there a small table and chairs for kids to sit together? Um, that's wonderful because children enjoy sitting with each other during fellowship, but it also allows their parents to go talk to other adults. Is there a place to change a diaper that's safe and sanitary? Um, a parent really is looking for something like that to make them feel comfortable in a space. And a little bit about schedules. Child care is really important. It really is something that should be available for committee meetings, worship, meeting for business, adult religious education events. There are different ways of doing it, different ways to find caregivers. And along with that, it's often the way that it makes it possible for parents of young children to participate fully in the life of the meeting. And we need to not assume that people who are parents either can participate or that they cannot. I frequently hear things like, well, they have kids and a job, they probably can't do this. Let's not make assumptions for people about their time and their energy and their leadings. It might be just the way that they're looking to become involved and find a way into feeling belonging in a meeting. It cannot hurt to ask and to ask what might make it possible for them to serve or to participate, whether it's changing the time or making um, it on Zoom or providing childcare. So shifting a little bit into from welcome and um, that aspect of belonging to thinking about what it is we do with our young people and children in programs for them. Um, we're in a liminal space and I wonder what the opportunity here is. This is a slide we might not have had in this presentation if it weren't for COVID, but in a way the disruption of this time, the long interruption to our normal way of doing things really creates a destabilized place that we might wonder where the light is getting in. And where are there opportunities and possibilities for rethinking our practices and structures? Maybe ones that weren't really working for us even before the pandemic. So where do we go during this time and as we seek to see the other side of the experience of the pandemic? Um, I've chosen this image of a labyrinth on purpose because a labyrinth is not a maze or a puzzle. It's a path forward. It twists and turns, and sometimes it moves us away from the center where we're trying to get to. But if we continue on, we can reach that destination. During this time, there's been a great deal of disruption and a loss of momentum. 
loss of momentum to coming and being part of church and meeting communities. It's something that's being written about a great deal um, by people who work in ministry. And the place where the loss of momentum has perhaps been the hardest has been in children and youth ministry and the programs for them. For families, the interruption to their routine um, participation in a meeting community has been extended. And um, for parents of youngest children who are not yet vaccinated, it's been particularly long. So what are some things that we can do to seek to support families in returning? One is to really think about asking families about their needs. What do they need to be um, returning and to be part of the meeting community again? <coughs> Excuse me, how can we center the needs of families and welcome for them? And this really includes invitation. Um, really reaching out directly, um, letting people know you've missed them, that you'd love to see them return, um, really making a direct um, connection with people. It may be that creating synchronous and asynchronous programs can support um, schedules and some flexibility for families and inclusion of children. Um, at my meeting, we've continued to make a Zoom link available for some of the times that we're in our program with children. Um, some things that we do don't work as well. But when there are um, things happening with the children's program where someone could join that way, we make a link available. And it has meant that for some families where maybe someone wakes up not feeling well, but a sibling really wanted to come or a parent finds it's just not going to work into a busy Sunday for them to drive to the meeting house, the children can still come and participate. Planning that explores why we have a program, why we do something, it can help to reveal and reshape how we do those things. I really encourage meetings as you're thinking about planning for the next fall to stop and ask why. It seems like such a simple question, but why do you have a children's program? Why is this something you put time and energy and resources into? It's not about questioning whether or not you're doing it. There may be other things that you end up questioning whether you'll return to them. It's really asking um, to think about what's important in offering a program and in identifying that it might help you to see how you want to offer a program. This is just a little sidebar from our past. The Friends Intelligencer was the Hicksite um, publication that merged um, when the reconciliation happened between Hicksite and Orthodox Friends in Philadelphia Yearly Meeting in 1955. Uh, the Friends Intelligencer merged with um, the Friend, which was the Orthodox um, publication, to become what we know as the Friends Journal today. So this is a 1955, maybe right before the reconciliation, a 1955 edition called Religious Education for All. And there's a wonderful piece in here where Vesta Haynes talks about religious education as lifelong um, spiritual formation, um, as learning that needs to really extend across all of our lives. She goes on in the article to lift up support for parents and families and to talk about the importance of connection between generations. She says parents need help in developing their own spiritual lives. Back to those three needs again. And so alongside that echo from our past um, and things that Vesta helps us to look forward to again now, I just want to pause to say that the idea that that's the way we've always done it can really be one for us to let go of. Um, the idea of first day school only goes back to the mid-1800s um, when there was a shift from um, what had been experiential, grounded in all ages worship, um, learning about how to be a Quaker. Um, it became education that happened outside of worship, um, often in classrooms. Um, and the word school was added onto it. And so um, the years that followed, and this is part, of course, of larger theological and community history for us, but the years that followed um, saw a proliferation, not just for Quakers, but for other 
um, denominations as well of religious education curricula and content that not only separated children from adults, but was scaffolded by ages. And um, one of the things that Vesta Haynes talks about in her 1955 piece is the importance of supporting people who work for, with children in meetings, but also the, um, the way in which children um, need to be um, uh, encouraged, um, fostered, and developed to be in worship. She talks about their presence should be accepted as natural and normal with no sentimentality that the meeting for worship is basic and necessary, can be appreciated by children. So a little bit more about this um, in a couple slides, but just to lift up, the children were in worship with their families um, throughout Quaker history, um, more than we often ask our children to today. And um, that this is something that is not, that's the way we've always done it. Um, is part of um, changes over time. And so I stop and wonder um, if we might go back and think about what was important and why we did it that way in the past. If you look at Philadelphia Yearly Meetings, um, Faith and Practice, and the queries um, for religious education in the home and meeting, and they are linked there, um, you will find that there is a real focus on three things, preparation, formation, and belonging. That um, the queries lift up ideas around the importance of preparation for worship in our community. Preparation to live a life consistent with the principles and testimonies of our faith. Formation learning that includes a variety of topics, and some meetings do more of these than others. And that experiential learning is so important that engages and supports Quaker identity and a knowing and belonging among friends. Belonging. So if we think about where we come from is actually a varied history in terms of children in worship, children in their own programs. And I actually think both are really important. A little bit like a family meal. Children need a children's table where they're with their peers. And they also need to know that there's a place for them at the big table. And if we think about those queries in faith and practice, um, how might we better align our religious education planning with them? I think, friends, this is really a moment to um, be encouraged to rethink the scholastic model of first day school and lessons and to support a model that's more about um, learning at home and at meeting in our yearly meeting um, in all ages spiritual community. So look where you want to go. Um, I wonder about the idea of letting go of only having age-based groups and sometimes having multi-generational meeting for learning, of letting go of instruction and a lesson model, which is very adult-centered, to more experiential learning and practicing. Things like youth meeting for business, which is a powerful thing if you have not experienced it. Can we move past the idea of just the one hour on Sunday morning to thinking about are there other times in the week um, where we can gather with families? Um, are online spaces um, at all part of the answer for our meeting community? Are there things we can offer people for doing asynchronously at home? Um, we're not going to win the fight against all the things that tug at a family's um, time um, over a weekend and on a Sunday morning. So if we are truly um, wanting to welcome families with children, knowing the pressures on their time, is it possible to rethink some of the times we do things to make that welcome real? And children in worship, I really believe from experience that children can be in worship for more than 50 minutes at the beginning or the end of the hour. And this may not be something for every week, but it's something to explore all ages community worship. 
there's so much uncertainty, it feels like, from week to week in some meetings about who will be there and how to plan. And so I would lift up the idea that intergenerational community can be a real foundation as we begin to renew our communities and come back together again. When we've thought about the why and the how, then there's the question of what. What resources to use um, in a religious education program with Quaker young people? And these are just some suggestions. There are many more, but these are ones that align with our witness in Philadelphia yearly meeting right now around climate change and addressing racism and um, membership and belonging, which here I've thought about as being about belonging and Quaker identity for younger friends. So these are linked to some excellent resources and curricula. And part of the purpose in lifting this up is um, let's not wait um, for our children to be grown-ups for them to share in our witness. If we are a meeting who is um, taking on climate change as a serious part of our witness to the world, how are we including our children in that? Um, are they um, being... Um, experimenting and having um, learning around some of those same things in their children's program. How are we being an all ages community together around the things that are important to us as friends? The chicken egg nature of families and children in the meeting. And this brings us around to thinking about worship. So which needs to come first? Do you wait for families to come to you and then you create a program? Or does a meeting create a program hoping that people will come and find you? The chicken and the egg. I would suggest that you already have what you need. What we all have is worship. And worship is at the center of our lives as friends. So how can we welcome families in worship? All ages worship is worship in which people of every age are understood to be equally important. That our worship isn't centering only the needs and the comfort of children and also not only the needs and the comfort of adults. Worship connects us to one another and our identity and experience as friends. How can we make spaces, literally make spaces in our meeting rooms that say you are welcome here? You belong here. This is a picture of the corner in Westchester meeting where there is now a rocking chair and a little table and pillows and a basket of books. It's a space that was created to say to families, you and your children are welcome to be with us in worship. This meeting, which is my home meeting, also does do all ages community worship a few times a year where the children are with us for the entire hour. Um, there are things to help support them, like quilts on the floor and very quiet things like pipe cleaners um, for hands to stay busy while hearts and minds are listening. We seek to do this um, so the children know that there is a place for them in our worship. One of the things that research shows is that when children do not have experiences of worshiping with the faith community they're growing up in, they are less likely to stay connected. And change in worship is a primary means by which congregations adapt and grow. So how is worship both central to our collective identity and our spiritual vitality, and also, if we're willing to rethink some of the ways we do things, it might help us to grow. Working to balance um, age-specific spaces with time in all age spaces um, is big work, but it's worth us doing because it, again, sends messages to families that they and their children are all welcome and all belong. So I, I get asked questions about outreach, um, and that's really where this presentation started, with thinking about outreach to families. And I've come to see that outreach is much more than just invitation. It's also more than even the warmest of welcomes. Outreach is grounded in the bigger work of creating space for belonging and inclusion which includes thinking about our messaging, 
um, thinking about our actual spaces, thinking or rethinking how our worship is um, open and welcoming to all people, and that our spiritual formation programs are about lifelong spiritual formation and that they make space for children in particular to be um, having experiential um, learning and um, opportunities for those ideas of belonging and practice. If people can see themselves in our story, when they walk into our spaces, when they see who's gathered for worship, they are more likely to want to be part of it. All together now. Let's seek together, friends, to create all ages community. It is truly vital to the future of our Quaker community. And I welcome conversation and feedback um, opportunities to visit with meetings, and hope that we'll be in touch with each other.